Hello, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to this debate, Institutions on Life Support. My name is Rob Walsh. I'm a medical student and one of the organisers of the Sheffield Salon. I'm chairing today's debate. This debate, which is in association with the Health Service Journal, <coughs> aims to bring together the threads of the institutions in crisis strands that is running throughout the day. This morning, we looked at the crisis in the concept of leadership. Uh, and this afternoon, we'll have panels on the parallel crises in the C of E, uh, medicine and the police. But it isn't just uh, those institutions that are in trouble. The BBC is still trying to recover from the fallout of the Savile affair, whilst its competitors in the press are doing no better, facing the prospect of state regulation after the Leveson inquiry. British politicians, who were once said to inhabit the mother of parliaments, are even less trusted, even before the expenses scandal. And social services seem to stagger from one child protection scandal to another. So why is there this universal sense of crisis throughout the public services? Has the point of serving the public been lost under waves of reforms and targets? Or are today's institutions just not up to the job uh, for the complexities of the 21st century? So to discuss these questions, uh, I've got a, a fantastic panel here for you today. And speaking in the order that I'll introduce them, we have Ben Lucas. Ben is the Principal Partner at RSA 2020 and Chair of Public Services at the RSA and has previously held a range of roles in public affairs after having been one of Jack Straw's advisors in the formative days of New Labour. Next we'll have Jessica Crow, Executive Director of the Centre for Public Scrutiny, an independent charity founded in 2003 to promote better scrutiny and accountability in decision making across the public sector. Amongst other roles, she was previously a councillor and deputy mayor of Hackney Council. Next we'll have John Holbrook. Uh, John is a barrister specialising in public law. He's written widely uh, for places including Spiked and the New Law Journal and argues for more common sense, fewer laws and fewer lawyers, which certainly makes him unusual for a lawyer. And then speaking last, we'll have Alistair McLennan, who's the editor of the Health Service Journal and has been for seven of the last 11 years. In June, he was named as Professional Magazine Editor of the Year, the only person to have won that accolade twice. And that's just on the end there. So, to kick us off, Ben, if you'd like to talk for four or five minutes. Sure. I want to make three quick points and then give a couple of illustrations. The points are about my view that one of the reasons we've had a decline uh, in trust in institutions is because the basis of consent through civil society and civil society organisations has corroded in the last uh, two decades. Secondly, that there's too narrow a strata of people uh, in public life. And thirdly, that there's a profound change in the relationship between professionals and citizens. So the first point, I don't need to labour this very much, but it's, a, it's just some basic facts. In 1979, there were 13 million people who were members of trade unions. Uh, today, there are about 7 million. So trade union membership in Britain has roughly halved. And Whereas it was the case in the past that trade unions, local government, church <laughs> organisations and a number of other voluntary sector organisations were part of a web of social relationships which public institutions related to, those, inter those countervailing institutions, particularly in working class communities, have pretty much disappeared or are not taken seriously at central government level. Therefore, there are no intervening ways in which the public institutions can mediate directly to citizens. So a lot of the consent on which they operate has been lost. Secondly, politics in particular uh, has increasingly, and this is partly a reflection of that uh, collapse in working class institutions in Britain, has been drawn from an increasingly narrow strata of people who, so far as the public are concerned, basically all look the same. So whether or not one of them went to Eton and another of them went to a relatively privileged North London Comprehensive is sort of irrelevant to the public as a whole because they all look pretty much the same. And that sense of politics as being a very narrow vocation now rather than something that's representative of a larger body politic has definitely, I think, eroded the consent for it. Third point is that in, in an age of increasingly assertive uh, consumerism and individualism and technological change, the power that many citizens have and the information they have at their disposal means that the relative role of professionals in many uh, areas has been challenged, and understandably so. 
if you think of health, education, many other areas, the reality is, and this is what much of our work at 2020 Public Services is based on, public uh, and social value is co-created between citizens and professionals. You don't get a healthier population just by having better hospitals. You get a healthier population if people themselves take more responsibility and control over their own lives, their diets, the way they behave and so on. So that understanding of the critical relationship between a more assertive citizen who's much less likely to trust professionals is something that it seems to be the institutions to varying degrees are having to go through thinking about at the moment. Finally, a few very quick examples. I noticed that in the blurb for this, uh, Hillsborough was mentioned. That was 24 years ago. I'm a Nottingham Forest fan and I was at Hillsborough. And one of the things that, that struck me uh, about that is although a lot of the talk since has been about the cover-up, actually the behaviour of authorities during the day is as revealing of the problems of trust between institutions and the public as anything that happened afterwards. Two examples of that. Firstly, there was no information at all at any point given to uh, the 50,000 people inside the crowd about what was happening. So although in front of you, you could see literally dead bodies on a football pitch, Kenny Dalgleish, the Liverpool manager, was instructed to issue a statement from the dressing room, so he couldn't see what was happening on the pitch, to say that uh, the police were calling for calm and that the game would be restarted as soon as possible. And of course this led to a lot of black humour, I mean how on earth could you play a football game around people lying prostrate on a football pitch. And throughout two and a half hours of holding people in a ground, there wasn't once ever an explanation of what the authorities were trying to do, why they were trying to hold them there, part of which was based on the fact that there was only one way into the ground that ambulances could go and they didn't want people to leave because the ambulances wouldn't be able to come in if, if people left, but they didn't explain that. Secondly, there were some people trying to get on the pitch because if you take a crowd of 50,000 people you can have quite a few people with medical qualifications. The response for the police was to train guard dogs at the crowd even though there would never been a history of violence between Nottingham Forest and Liverpool and there was no actual uh, aggression or violence at the ground. Fascinating example to me of the, break, of, of the way in which authorities do not engage in an honest conversation. Second, much more recently, um, only three years ago, the deficit. Not one of the political parties went into the last election having an open and honest conversation with the public about the scale of the deficit. Uh, and I suspect we're going to go into the next election with no honest conversation about the long-term demand challenges that public services in Britain face. And if you don't have an honest conversation, you don't try and think about how people are going to be able to take more responsibility and build up social institutions that will enable them to take more responsibility, then you're going to continue to have the, uh, the long-term decline in trust and legitimacy in institutions that we've seen over the last two decades in Britain. Okay. Thanks a lot, Ben. Jessica. Okay. Um, thanks very much. Um, so I want to say three things uh, broadly. Firstly, let's not overdo how much of a crisis we're in. And I want to say sort of three things about that. Firstly, um, it was ever thus. So there was a poll of uh, people who, asked, who were asked what do they think uh, of their MPs. And, that, who, and the vast majority said they're all in it for themselves. They, have, they put the interests of themselves and their party over the interests of the, the country and the national interest. And that was in 1944, at the, the height of, you know, just before the D-Day landings when the whole country was sort of supposedly pulling together. So nobody's ever liked MPs is the first thing. Secondly, actually public satisfaction, particularly amongst people who actually use public services, is really high and has been for a number of years at the highest it, it's, it's ever been. And in some cases it's actually rising, notably in local and um, services provided by local authorities. So, um, you know, let's, let's not forget that, that there might be a difference between people who actually use services and the sort of common commentators and, and Twitterati. And thirdly, um, is it a problem if we're actually a little bit sceptical and a little bit untrusting and questioning of what those with authority and in institutions say? So we don't w want to be kind of faced with a sort of Stepford Wives situation where we all say everything's perfect. However, I think there are some things that should concern us, my second point. Firstly, there is rising public concern about the future of public institutions. And I think this is related to the impact of austerity. There are 31% of the public are now worried about the potential impact of austerity on public services and uh, what they, things that they rely on. And perhaps more, more worryingly, sort of underneath that, if you unbit that kind of overall um, figure, um, certain groups and certain public services show um, varying levels of dissatisfaction. And this should be worrying for politicians because one of the groups where dissatisfaction is rising is the elderly who are more likely to vote. So there's a, a, an issue there. 
but also um, I think some issues around inclusion and community health that things like uh, the people who use services for the disabled um, again are showing more higher levels of dissatisfaction so there may be um, some sort of breakdown and uh, differential levels of, of mistrust that we need to think about. And then thirdly, I think there are common themes in the causes of some of the crises that are mentioned in, in, the, in the, the, the blurb for, for this session. So that whether it's the banks and LIBOR, and Midstaff's hospital, the BBC, I, I think the, the thing that this primarily tells us is about <coughs> institutions who've lost sight of their primary responsibility to serve the public. And it's about serving and listening and this kind of service ethos that I think is absolutely crucial for institutions that have engagement with the public. And I think primarily it's, it's about a failure to listen. Um, so you get a kind of a good, um, throughout the, the last government there was a heavy emphasis on management, on performance indicators, on improving performance. Um, and that had you know, really good outcomes that you know, people weren't waiting on trolleys for hours and hours um, when they went into NE. So that's, it's important to focus on those basics. But I think too much of that upwards accountability means you don't necessarily listen to what's actually happening um, amongst the people who are experiencing and indeed providing those services. It's about listening to the stories of people um, is as important. The organisation that I run, the Centre for Public Scrutiny, um, our mission is threefold. We want accountability, transparency and involvement in our public services. And we would say that you need all three acting together. So you can't just have votes every four or five years and that provides you with your accountability for public institutions. You can't just rely on publishing a shed load of data to be more transparent. It's about how you, you do business. Um, that doesn't make you a transparent information, just publishing uh, information. And you can't just do some public consultation exercises to... Um, um, to have a really inclusive institution. So you need all three working together and infusing kind of how you do your job in some of these institutions. They are different from private individuals, from private bodies. There is this concept of, of the public. I am accountable to the public out there. What would they think? Would I be worried if people find out what I was doing and how can people outside influence the powerful? So I would say we need a rethink of the culture in our public institutions to restore and or maintain trust, not just because it would be a good thing, not just because institutions are in crisis, because I think we shouldn't overplay that, but because it will lead to better decisions and outcomes from the money that's invested in some of those public institutions, because by and large we're talking about public money and it will help them be better at what they do in serving the public and perhaps avoid the slightly doomsday scenario which describes this session. John. Public institutions, it, it seems to me the key point is this. To have strong um, organisations, strong public institutions, it's all about values, culture, ethos. Um, you have to have a strong set of coherent values that really race through every vein of that public body or seep out of every pore. It's essentially about having an internal dynamic that holds that organisation together and gives it a strong sense of purpose. That, after all, is really what public service is about. It's about knowing what it is you are trying to achieve um, and having values that enable you to meet that objective. Now, th that's perhaps easy to say, but let's just uh, think that through a bit. Ninety years ago, Britain had an empire. It was an empire that spanned one-fifth of the world's population. Now, I'm not going to advocate that we try and rebuild an empire, but the only point I want to make about this is that, that you have to acknowledge that that was a very impressive organisational accomplishment. And just ask yourselves now, is that the sort of thing any of our institutions could achieve? Clearly, the answer is no. I mean, let's just focus on the military for a moment. Ninety years ago, the, the, the military had a clear sense of what they were about about taking control of populations, people and land. A simple objective, moreover an objective that was shared by everybody within the political elite. Look at the military now. There was a report that came out yesterday from Policy Exchange that talked about the <coughs> legal system paralysing our military forces. Now, paralysis may be a slightly strong word and it would be wrong to only look at the extent to which legal regulation is responsible for any sorts of problems in the military. But I don't think anyone would doubt that our military, just as an example, is no longer clear about what its objectives are. The politicians aren't clear about what its objectives are. You see the debates you have over something like humanitarian interventions. Is that really what the army are about? Is that really what the army can deliver? 
No one's too sure about it, but the one thing you do know is that the public also are not content about humanitarian interventions. And that, for example, is one of the reasons why you get more suing. People saying, oh, well, look, if we're in Afghanistan to help people, then what about my poor loved one who's gone there with, with inappropriate gear or inadequate training? Why can't I get some redress? I, I've just used the military as an example, but it seems to me it's a very good example. In the, the same sort of problem that's affecting the military, you, you could point the same finger at any one of our public institutions. Now, there is a recognition that there is this problem with our public institutions. The difficulty is that every single reform which is being promoted to try and tackle this problem is merely making the problem worse. It is increasing the extent to which these organisations no longer have a coherent sense of values. Essentially what all governments for the last 20 years or so have been trying to do is to replace that internal coherence with external forces. They're almost giving up on the idea that organisations can, uh, can know clearly what they're doing and they're trying to force a, a certain agenda or a certain behaviour onto each public institution. You see that clearly with things like targets, targets set from on high. I don't think you can have targets because the way organisations work is just far too sophisticated for any sort of target to be able to... Uh, properly set an objective. That's been tried, it, it's now not been abandoned but the government recognises its shortfall. So it's introduced, particularly over the last few years, regulatory organisations such as Ofsted, the CQC, the IPCC, the Health and Safety Executive and so on and so forth. External institutions that are supposed to keep a watching eye on these organisations to make sure they work properly. But as we know from many of the scandals that have unfolded over the last few years and take the Orchard View care home uh, scandal that broke yesterday, um, that, that institution was, was, was given a good rating by the, the CQC. Litigation, I've mentioned that, that's another external way of trying to get organisations to be better. Um, customer pressure, which I know some speakers from the floor have spoken about, that's another way um, of trying to, to, to give some direction to these institutions. The use of hidden cameras, something that's been suggested this week. I mean, all of this is about keeping a watching brief on what these organisations are doing. It will not work. The only way these institutions can be made to work properly is by internally them knowing <coughs> clearly what they are about and having the values that enable them to perform those tasks. OK, thanks a lot, John. Alistair. Thanks very much. Um, always a danger going last that everybody um, that spoke before you will have said um, things that you wanted to say, and I agree with 90% of the um, uh, of what has been said. Um, knowing that I might be in that position, um, I'm going to take a slightly different approach to the um, institutional crisis, and obviously, as you might imagine, I'm going to talk about the NHS. It was Philip Larkin who wrote that uh, religion was a vast, moth-eaten musical brocade um, created to pretend we never die. And Nigel Lawson, who declared that the NHS was the uh, nearest thing the English have to a religion. <laughs> and it is the expectations which flow from such a relationship which threaten the NHS as the kind of institution we have known. Simon Stevens, who was Tony Blair's former health policy advisor, intellectual driving force behind New Labour's health reforms, many of the targets talked about there, and very possibly the new, the next leader of the NHS, had a framed newspaper headline above his desk in number 10 to remind him of the inherent futility of his job. It read, NHS in crisis as people live longer. <laughs> so the NHS is an institution in crisis. But it's not the crisis captured by headlines uh, bemoaning hospital scandals or, or uncaring nurses. Not that those aren't issues, but that's not the crisis. Truth be told, as actually has been mentioned before, satisfaction in the NHS is holding up remarkably well, given the tightening financial situation it operates under. Now, the true crisis is um, largely existential in nature. I can get away with talking about existential crises in this forum. I never, I'm not allowed to do it when I'm writing editorials for HSJ, so it's a, I feel quite freed up to be able to talk about it. Modern science offers such hopes for extending longevity and well-being that the gap of between what is will soon become possible, what the NHS can hope to offer, can only widen. 
Now, the coalition, we've talked about um, external consumer forces being applied to the NHS. The coalition has introduced the friends and family test in which every patient will be asked, would you recommend this service to friends and family? Giving the NHS the equivalent of what the private sector calls a net promoter score. There are many problems with the methodology of this friends and family test. But it's not why that will struggle to give the NHS a view of the dangers, what I think the real dangers are, ahead. Who, who do NHS hospitals treat? Uh, increasingly, the patient mix is dominated by people in the 70s and 80s. Trends in gender longevity being what they are, those people are mainly women. Are these mainly elderly women happy with the service they get? In large cases, of course they are. They have grown up in a society which viewed the NHS as a welfare safety net. I remember a senior figure in NHS Scotland telling me that the biggest drag on their efforts to deal with the very poor health outcomes that that country has was the fatalism of the people, of the, of the, of the population. They expected to get ill as they got old. And any few and, and to fall over, and when they fell over, the NHS would come along and care for them. And any extra years that the, the NHS could buy them, well, that, you know, that was a bonus. Compare the attitude with that which we developed by many people in this room today, people, say, under 25 years of age, who, if you avoid the epidemic of lifestyle diseases, so don't get fat, don't get a sexually transmitted disease, don't become an alcoholic, etc., etc., you can reasonably expect to live to witness the period when, the, when it is declared that we have achieved escape velocity from the diseases of ageing. DNA testings are becoming increasingly popular. I've had mine done courtesy of a US organisation called 23andMe. When I first researched the test, it was priced at $299. Uh, when I bought it just before Christmas, um, a few months after that, fallen to $99. Sequencing the entire, ge entire human genome has fallen from $10 million to $10,000 in four years. My results received I'd, uh, uh, that I'd identified a, a raised chance of developing Alzheimer's. And sadly, many of us will clog up pathways as we troop into consulting rooms with data the NHS is years away from collating and ask for solutions the NHS, not she said any health service system, is not equipped to provide. However, as tailored therapies based on genetic analysis begin to develop, those who are well informed and have the means to do so will be exploring those developing uh, cures and mitigations. They're, uh, wherever they're developed, there are already thousands of those people, soon there'll be tens of thousands, then there'll be hundreds of thousands. Will they be satisfied with what an NHS, whose resources will have to be focused on caring for multiple mobilities of older people? I very much doubt it. It is this that poses the greatest challenge to the previous reliance on the NHS as, an NH, as, a, as the answer to all health problems, the very thing which, under, which underpins its status as the best love um, British institution. OK, thank you very much, Alistair. Let's throw it open to the audience. Thanks very much. Claire Gerardo from the Royal College of GPs. Fantastic talks. My sense is that a fish rots at its head. And the prevailing culture we have at the moment is one of cruelty, it's one of separating us from our, our kins, it's one of blaming the sick, distancing ourselves from the unworthy poor, such as immigrants, and distancing ourselves from the unworthy sick, such as those who dare to have lifestyle problems. And until we address that, no matter what the culture within organisations are, the prevailing culture set by those who lead our, our country is that of, uh, as Margaret Thatcher says, there's no such thing as a community, then I think our institutions will continue to fail because our institutions are under such threat by our politicians who want to destroy the last vestiges of trust that anybody has in them. I think it might be worth, Alistair, writing about existential crisis um, <laughs> because I think it, that, that, that could go a long way. Um, I'm all for people having existential crisis, but particularly um, for those of us that work in any public service because I think we're having that all the time teachers, nurses, doctors, etc. If any of you work in the public service in the room, I'm sure you're in, in those instances where half of your day is spent by doing things that you think is completely pointless, reporting things to people that also think it's completely pointless, <laughs> producing reports which people read and the people reading it think it's pointless, <laughs> um, which in my book is an existential crisis. So my question to the panel is, how is it possible for public institutions to break, break free of this? I think a good starting point is to ask those questions and to be very honest about ourselves. Because the degree to which institutions are in crisis, I think, we're, if anything, we're understating. 
Um, and I think we do need to look at ways in which internally, as John was saying, we can begin to get through this. So the existential crisis, let's talk about it. Let's be honest about it. Um, and let's, um, I'll be interested to hear from the panel how they think we can break free from this. My concern is, in, in breaking free from this, we will come up against vested interests, which aren't necessarily the politicians. There are other people in the public sector who have built a career out of many of the issues which are compounding our own existential crisis. Ben, I want to talk about specifically the sort of the decline of working class institutions that you talked about. And as someone who went to a Labour conference in Brighton recently as a steward, you can tell the sheer just middle class snobbery that exudes from that organisation, the contempt for, you know, the little people who are quite clearly not capable of running it. And you can see that runs through the managerialism of public services where uh, nurses to managers ratios have gone the wrong way where there's more managers now to nurses and the process of actually having less hospital beds since Labour came in because, you know, what the little people want, more beds in hospitals, is actually not what's really needed according to the professional experts. But you talked about, I don't know, there was a bit of negativity in it that you couldn't see where these organisations were coming from. I don't work in a public service, but I'm going to every fan-owned club in England and Wales. You know, the new, I think they're the new working-class institutions where they actually run the football clubs themselves. They're the ones who run the facility. And obviously, the way it's run is far superior, and they feel ownership over it. So the only good thing, and of course, Jessica talking about how people were more positive about services operated locally in their areas which they felt they had more control over and therefore more authority. To wrap it all up, the guy I met who, at the Labour conference who was actually quite good was Maurice Glassman, who talked about how if you really want to you know, make it better for public services or services that we expect to be provided to be respected and continue to work, it's actually to throw them back to the pre-welfare state Labour tradition of having it operated locally, so credit unions, mutual societies which are run not by well-off middle-class people but working-class people on the ground themselves. And is that could that be the future for what we consider to be public services? Uh, just a riposte against localism, really. Um, my, my local hospital is, is Trafford General, which is the first ever uh, NHS hospital, yeah. which uh, the local community is, 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 is rightly proud. But it's awful. I mean, it just wants raise into the ground, burning down. It needs to be forgotten about. And yet the localist campaign, and you know, everybody wants localism and transparency, the, the local campaign is just entirely focused around saving our local hospital and not around providing really efficient, really good public health service, which they could do in, into much better uh, local hospitals uh, that we have. A, a similar uh, issue, I think, is happening in the, in the labour movement, where, where many of the trade unions, uh, having realised that there's a problem with organising their own labour, uh, are now trying to organise around the community. Uh, and organising around the community uh, means organising around uh, lots of disparate groups who have no real unifying purpose, and where you know community organising inherently involves you know, dividing the community uh, rather than uniting it. So th that's not an answer. That that's not what, what's what's the, what's the answer. That's you know maybe a question around some of the solutions that are being proposed, and I don't believe particularly work. Yeah, and I think there has been a crisis institutions that is really <coughs> remarkable in England, which was the country more than any other country in the world that just had institutions par excellence. You had political parties, unlike any other, any other, any other country. You know, really down to every neighbourhood, from 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 Parliament in the, the lo local Labour or Conservative club. Um, you had a public service with a public service eth ethic unlike any other country. And also very in strong institutional cultures, such that every institution was almost its own country, with its own language, its forms of regulation. Um, very informal, but very powerful. <coughs> um, and you had a massive shift in the 90s, particularly, uh, where you had the subjugation of, of institutions to central state control. And since then, the change has been massive, such that I think that it probably we have more institutional crises than any other country in Europe, going from the strongest to the, to the weakest, I think. I think there's a, almost we've lost the capacity for thinking about institution and institutional failures. So whenever there's a care homes failure or whatever, it's a question of who can we blame? And so all the kind of problems with procedures or whatever um, are always placed on one individual who everyone conspires to, to, to get out. Um, 
So there's almost there, there, there's a complete inability to think in, in collective terms of how these things are organised. I think every solution it always makes things worse. So I think the point about targets and transparency were the, the two primary solutions to this. Um, make things worse in the sense that what they do is they make people accountable to a bureaucratic authority and not actually to 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 the public. So they estrange a public ser service worker from from the public. So that's why you have cases where police will encourage women to withdraw rape allegations because it, it messes up their targets. Or essentially, it's that kind of targets attempt to make public in private people behave as if they're publicly spirited. What they actually do is make those individuals. Um, further estranged from the public and accountable to the external authority. So I think uh, one, so for me, the three things would be, first of all, institutional thinking. Don't always blame it on the individual. Don't, don't think that you can say because somebody says something in a meeting that that's the whole problem with, with, um, with the care system. Um, and get rid of targets and, and visibilities. I think those two things really just um, make those, uh, make public service workers further estranged from the public and further estranged from the job that they're trying to do and accountable to external authority. The point about um, just leave, you know, work in the public service, just leave us alone. Government regulators, just leave us alone. I wrote about this uh, in the magazine uh, th th this week. Um, absolutely, there is over-regulation at the moment and there is, in many cases, too much central control. But I... So I speak to a lot, you know, the NHS is full of different tribes. And I, at the moment, I am detecting more divergence between what those tribes think is the answer to the NHS's problems. So the idea that you simply, you know, the regulators and the government take a stand side and the service just sorts it out itself, I think there's a significant question mark over that. Maybe what John was speaking about, about the, you know, the breakdown in the shared sense of mission. But th that there is a real lack of consensus across the NHS at the moment about what the answer is. People who run hospitals <coughs> and people who run, you know, who are involved in general practice, they tend to have a very, very different view about what the future looks like in, in general. OK, thanks, Alistair. John? On this question of what can be done, um, uh, I've got two ideas. Uh, the first one, it seems to me, is that these institutions need to have a serious discussion about what it is they need to be doing and it seems to me that they can shed a huge number of the functions that they are currently doing. <coughs> Let's just take the, the case of the NHS. It seems to me, and, and when the NHS was set up, it was quite clear it was about trying to cure people who are sick. That is no longer the only objective of the NHS. It is now about trying to regulate people's lifestyles, making sure that people are happy, making sure that their well-being is, is, is looked after. Uh, a, a friend of mine has, has had asthma for over 40 years. He regularly gets invited into his surgery, uh, and unless he goes in, he won't get a repeat prescription for one of his inhalers that he's been taking for 40 years. And it, it's all about someone who knows next to nothing about asthma telling him how to take this inhaler that he's been taking for 40 years. That is a huge waste of time and money, and it is clearly only being done so that someone can tick a box uh, and receive a payment. So there is massive scope for whittling down the actual functions that these institutions perform. And incidentally, I know there's a lot said about cuts. Um, politicians never talk about cuts. They always talk about efficiencies. Um, I actually think it would be quite useful if we did have a serious debate about mm. cuts, and there would be a huge number of functions that, that could be cut off. The other point I would make is about restoring professional autonomy. It does seem to me that um, the standing of professionals has been greatly reduced over the last 20 years in, in particular. Um, I, I saw something last week, the latest guidance as it's always called, it really ought to be called garbage, but it always goes by the name of guidance. Uh, this particular piece of garbage came from NICE, the National Institute for <coughs> Clinical Excellence. And of course it's always draft guidance so that um, everyone can have their say on what form it should ultimately take. Um, but this particular guidance was about being nice to fat people. Um, and what it essentially meant, of course, no, one, no one's going to advocate that, that doctors should be nasty to fat people. It's always written in this gobbledygook management speak that means nothing. Uh, it means nothing save that it, is, it does actually have a serious impact on the way that professionals think. But what it, what it essentially will do is prevent doctors from giving people who are obese appropriate advice. Namely, consume less calories and exercise more. Doctors under this guidance will not be able to say that. Um, and that is another <coughs> example of, of guidance from on high 
shaping the way that professionals think uh, uh, and act, and it's whittling away at their professional autonomy. Okay, choose John, Jessica. Okay, um, I think so. There's a few things there, and, and I'll, I'll start with the, <coughs> this issue about uh, localism um, versus centralism, and I and I, I think we do need to be quite careful about the the balance between those because I think you can you can go too far. And I'm all, I was always struck when I was uh, a councillor, I'd go to these endless meetings with um, tenants on the local council estates where they would be raising things like you know why is there crime on our estate, why are there drug dealers, why is the street lights always out. <coughs> you know, reasonable questions, but they had to go to a local meeting, they had to go to a meeting and be empowered to have a conversation about it and to raise these, but people who lived in the middle class streets could just sort of rely on that. And so I do think that we shouldn't expect people to have to go and sort of agitate and work together to get decent public services. They should be there. And so we shouldn't expect people, you know, to have to engage and lobby and, and get involved in running things themselves when all they want to have is, is a decent life. And, uh, you know, we, we do expect people too often to do that. I remember there was a, an example uh, proposed by one of the ministers in the last government sort of talking about the, the brilliance of this hospital that had been built by the community in the Chicago projects, um, which, is, which is great given they didn't have one, but why should they have had to agitate and build their own hospital? We need to have a, a national system which does provide you know, some basic standards. Um, now, having, having said that, I do think that um, the point about the, the fish rots from the head is a really important one because there are many heads. And it's this point about the different cultures and the different um, languages in different institutions. And so I do think that you have more chance of delivering um, good outcomes if you do involve people and if the people at all the different different heads, different sized heads, um, do listen to what's going on throughout the rest of the body, and the body politic or the, the body fish. So that I think one of the things I think about transparency is that we've got focused on what it is that the people at the top are making visible. And so it's like, you know, we want a, an open door, an open window, we want a window so we can, we can see what they're doing. And for me, it's more about the window being open so that they can actually hear what's coming in as well. So that it, transparency is about a way of doing business. It's about what the professionals, how the professionals work. But it's about that there being that dialogue and that conversation um, so that it is two way. And this is where I think the, the current government has got it um, wrong about this idea. We need to be more transparent. We need to publish data. We need to have more of a conversation and a dialogue between those who provide services, those who make decisions about services, and those who experience the services. And so is that process of, of dialogue and sort of permeability, which I think could help us move forward. Ben. I'll try and touch on several of the different questions about the, fit, the fish rotting from the head, um, existentialism versus um, other forms of uh, crisis, um, and the decline of working class institutions and localism. And, and to me, a lot of it goes back to it. Someone was describing what happened in the 1990s. I think you've got to go back to the 1980s. In the 1980s, there was such a profound change, and uh, it was actually Margaret Thatcher saying there is no such thing as society, not there is no such thing as community, that summed up the view that was held by uh, the government in the 1980s at a time in which the social relationships and economic relationships in Britain were absolutely transformed. So um, the work that, most, that a lot of people did changed fundamentally, um, that we had a massive decline in manufacturing, a lot of northern towns lost their raison d'etre, uh, and a lot of working class institutions were literally hollowed out. In the years after that, you had a new Labour government, which I think thought that the only way it could deal with the levels of social inequality that had developed during the 1980s was through giving a, a stronger mandate to national public institutions to try and override the inequalities that had been created during the 1980s. The problem is, you can only do that up to a point. You can improve certain basic mm. universal standards, but beyond that point, actually what you need is, is more substantial social change in society, and you need communities to feel more empowered. And so the, the person who was talking about having been a, a steward at the Labour Party conference, I agree with what you were saying very much. And one of the things that I, found, I now find uh, most encouraging about the work I do is some of the work I'm doing with a group of councils that have called themselves cooperative councils. And what they're trying to do is recreate a sense of mutualism and cooperative uh, endeavour in their places by recognising that instead of being <coughs> an authority, local authorities are called authorities, they actually need to create a social compact with their community, look at how many of the services they run and other potential new businesses 
in those areas could be created as cooperatives. Because I, I think that the only way in which you're going to be able to create a stronger society with a better, clearer sense of, of what its relationship is with institutions and allow institutions themselves to behave properly as institutions is if you build up the social institutions in society that have been so diminished in the last two decades or so. That to me seems to be the biggest social priority. And the reality is, if you think about institutions, corporate institutions, without social consent, without a foundation in social organization, are actually a form of fascism. That's what, I mean, not of the, not of the Nazi variety, but certainly of the, the Italian fascist variety was based on the notion of strong institutions at the centre without the basis of, a so, of social and democratic support for them. I think it's a very dangerous place to go to only think about the institutions at the centre. You've also got to think mm. about building up the legitimacy, the consent uh, and the community organisation that is dependent on creating a sense of empowerment that has been lost from many communities in Britain. This coming Saturday, I've organised a mini conference in the village, in the industrial village in Yorkshire where I live, and it's called Power to the People. And we're precisely talking about the cooperative nature of how we might go forward. We've got a cooperative in our village that has completely revived. Um, it's called the Green Valley Grocers, and it, we now have a very powerful food network. So people are growing things, they're selling things through the shop. We, we've had volunteers <coughs> who were all, all taken off the jobs, seekers who, who came as volunteers and are now employed. I won't go on, but he's, it's had a revivalist mm. thing. Now this, we raised £15,000 in a month from people across the political spectrum. That then led us to fight, uh, yesterday we were, we were at the local council fighting off a planning application from an Aldi store, not because we don't like Aldi, but because what it will do to that industrial village in terms of transport and the retail impact. We've got 200 people now on our, on our mailing list. I have to tell you that the behaviour of our local authorities, planning officers and committee was abom abominable. And we have to put in a formal complaint. They asked us not to speak. 19 of us wanted to speak, three minutes each, they asked us not to. Democracy completely wiped out of the window. We refused to leave the chamber and eventually we got our way. But anyway, that's another, that's another story. But from this, what we've got is a powerful group of people from across political divides who've learned how to negotiate over a period of time and to have a consensus on the way that we would approach and protect what we care about. And I think there's a real case here for something about not running hospitals necessarily, but the kind of collegiate way that we might be able to operate. Now, just quick, I know I've only got one minute, but there's something that's missing from this debate, and that is the media living, mm. as you do, in the, in the goldfish bowl of that mm. kind of scrutiny. Mm. Mm. And also, the, the, the process has, become, has been become prioritised over the provision. So watching your back, making sure that process is running okay, making sure that you can't be blamed, not being accountable, but being uh, accused... You know, yeah. that's a big influence. I'm sorry I've gone on. From the floor and from the panel, there seems to be, to me, this um, our institutions attitude, basically. And before they really speak to us, I think they ought to really ask themselves, what it is that you're defending? I'm not sure that it's ever been ours. I mean, I worked in the NHS way back in the early 70s, and to be honest, even all of us who worked in it then, we knew it was just really a sticking plaster on a bleeding wound. That's not to decry anybody that works in the health service or any gov other government institutions, but really I think you ought to ask yourself what, what it is that you're trying to defend. I mean, I'd ask John to sort of espouse a little bit more about what sort of services and what sort of institutions we ought to be having and how we can get them. You've said a little bit, uh, John, about uh, what they ought to do, but how do we get to where, from where we are to... Uh, uh, from where we are now to where we ought to be. Um, this little bit about the community, um, you know, working class input, cooperative and mutuals. I mean, come on, you, you must have your old school of glasses on. I'm pretty working class. The working class have never been represented as an, as an open political demos in any institutions or in any political movement. If you're talking about the Labour Party and its working class institutions, you're talking about an infinitesimally small amount percentage of people that what politically active in any of those things. So you really start ask, ought to asking yourself about what you mean by working clack institutions and things being ours. I want to make two points about purpose, because it was raised earlier as being something that could unify people around a common set of values to drive the performance of institutions. 
I, I work as a management consultant, so I work in private sector, and I've been doing a lot of work in NHS recently. That's an observation. The purpose which an organisation is there for, I think, is really important to understand. So I think a lot of institutions get stuck in, this is what we do, rather than this is what we're there for. And when you, when you look at the question of purpose, so in, in the NHS that might be to care for people, uh, that seems quite clear and obvious. But what happens is that each organisation then splits itself into functional units, which gives itself targets, which then drives the behaviours within the organisation. And every large system where that happens, the people who are trying to hit their targets start promoting some things above others, deprioritizing other behaviors to hit their targets. And what happens is that the, everyone within the institution is working really hard, but no, there's a divorce there between what they're doing and the purpose of the organization. And we see that in hospitals, we see that in many systems where everyone's doing what they think is the right thing, but they've divorced themselves from the purpose. So I think it's really important that organisations and institutions need to be really clear what their purpose is and that in that purpose lies the targets that drive the behaviour of the system, not everyone chasing their own local ones. The problem with the NHS isn't there's too many old people, there's too many single people. Um, if you think about a couple, if one of them gets sick, the other one becomes the automatic living carer. I'm from a big Catholic family and uh, when my dad got ill, he had um, six sons and daughters looking after him and the NHS. I'm all for um, involvement of the public, but for example, my local hospital, they um, plan to streamline some services, but the peop local people mounted a massive campaign about it. But I think that was wrong because actually, don't you think sometimes that the people at the top can have a more long-term, broader view on what's actually more important and local people are more myopic, they're thinking, um, no, I didn't want to travel half an hour to my nearest hospital. They're not thinking about the long-term resource use. With this whole discussion of there needing to be more talking between the people and the institutions, surely that's a two-way street. I was recently asked to speak in favour of the NHS at a public speaking competition, and I have to say, before I started my research, I was terrified. I thought no one would accept my arguments. I mean, why would you? The NHS is failing. We're told that all the time. And then I did my research, and I suddenly realized that basically the media was lying to me. I mean, the NHS is an organization. It's the second largest employer in the world after the Chinese Red Army, or at least it was at the time that I did my research. And I thought, well, for an organization that large that doesn't have a military discipline, it works surprisingly well for 99% of the people. It's the envy of the arguably last remaining superpower in the world who literally tore itself apart these last two weeks trying to figure out how to implement a similar system. We need to figure out how to tell the people that our systems work, not just that they don't. Okay, thanks a lot. Two sort of divergent views about uh, what I was saying about uh, the importance of uh, cooperatives, working class institutions, communities and so on. I mean, to me, you know, we can have a whole sort of debate about, about the history here, but a lot of social change was about social organisation in community. Uh, and there's no doubt that in many communities, including communities I grew up in, and judging by your, your accent uh, at the back there, maybe where you grew up in, social institutions were stronger and more vibrant um, two or three decades ago than they are now. And I'm not just talking about political ones. I'm talking about sporting ones, for instance, uh, organisations that were associated with large workplaces that, that created sport, uh, football leagues, cricket leagues, um, that were also about social engagement, that were about adult education, all of which are much diminished now. And those are a rich layer of institutions that it seems to me a society depends on. It. And we have got a particular cultural, pro cultural and political problem in Britain. And so I think a big That's focus it. for politics, if you, if you care about social change in Britain, <coughs> has got to be about recreating social engagement from the grassroots upwards in order, in order to empower people uh, to take greater control. The other thing I, I'd, I'd say uh, about that is, is that when, when it's, it's said that the problem with local people is that they take the wrong decisions, uh, as, as for instance uh, is, is evidenced by their opposure to, uh, of the, the way that they oppose local hospital closures, it seems to me actually local people are acting perfectly rationally when they do that. Because I certainly buy the argument, we've got far too many A&E hospitals and we ought to refocus priorities and resources on GPs uh, and on, on primary care. But we haven't done at the moment. So if I'm faced with an, as an individual with a choice, what do I do? I'm going to go to the A&E. Because until I know that 
I'm engaged and my community is engaged in a proper choice, which we're not at the moment, we're just presented with decisions, then it's not surprising that you get opposition to those decisions. OK, fantastic. Jessica? Yeah, I, I, I think I'd say on this, this issue of, of, again, of localism versus centralism, I think what the, what the lady described there about your, your cooperative in, in your village is great, but it, can we rely on that to cover the whole country and to ensure that everyone um, has a decent standard of living? It seems to me you can't. Yeah. I, think, I think you do need vibrant social institutions, but you also need this, this point about taking the long view, about looking at what the whole country needs, about stewardship, about thinking not just about current communities who are able to agitate, but what about the future communities? What about future generations? So this kind of thinking about about what happens next and this idea about um, stewardship I think is an important role for public institutions to play and I think w one of the one of the big challenges we have is that um, people like yourself who get involved in these in these projects who put in lots of time and energy and see a good local result those those people are not because coming forward to get involved in our institutions they're not standing for the local council they're not standing to become MPs because you know they see as Ben described as I've described this kind of narrowing politics isn't for me actually what you're doing is politics but somehow we have this this divorce between so for me we, we need to get um our, it's not for me it's not one or the other we need <coughs> both strong strong um community bodies and communities but we also need strong public institutions and i do think it's about values and purpose but i haven't got time to talk about that okay john um Two points. First of all, uh, go back to first principles. Why do we have public institutions? It's worth asking that question. And I think it's essentially because it means w uh, we want institutions of the state that can do things that either we as individuals can't do or alternatively we think they can do them better. Uh, the police and the military and the NHS are obviously very good examples of that. But uh, it's very important to realise the other side of that equation, which is that actually individuals can actually do a great many things themselves. And what troubles me about a lot of the debate which is talking about building up social institutions is that people actually want to build up social institutions that do things that people can better do for themselves. Just take the case of education. I don't actually want my kids coming home in the evening and telling me that I'm not eating a healthy diet. I don't want them schooled in that way. That is my responsibility as a parent. And time and time again, just with education as an example, um, these state institutions are straying into areas which are actually matters for us as individuals to take responsibility for. The second point, very briefly, okay, interesting points made about targets and also about save our local hospital. The problem with all of these external ways of regulating, whether it's targets, targets, payments by results, asking local people, litigation or regulation, is that they all distort priorities. Um, ask local people, do they want their local hospital? Yes, of course they do. That's the rational thing for them to say. But they have a very partial view of what the NHS as a whole needs. And it's an abrogation of political responsibility that people who should be making these decisions are refusing to make them. OK, thanks a lot, John. Alistair. A lot of people have said what I would say. The, you know, the, the central point of this, debate, uh, of this debate has been the tension between uh, local influence and sort of national standards. Do we want the control with, that comes with local influence and the variability of services that will follow, or do we want lack of control with national standards but the sense that nobody is losing out because there's some kind of national pitch? That seems to me what has been the heart of this debate. I'm very intrigued by the idea of um, uh, marriage as the answer to the problems of the NHS, perhaps an idea for the, um, uh, for the next Conservative Party manifesto. Just to point on professional autonomy, it's interesting, we haven't got time to ex expose it. Variability is the curse of the NHS. A lot of that, not all, a lot of it is from professionals doing what they want to do. And in large cases, ignoring nice guidance. Most nice guidance is ignored. And I think that is a really interesting tension about it. How much are we prepared to let professionals, people who deliver our services, make their own decisions if it produces a variability in the, uh, in the level of service we receive? Okay, fantastic. Let's thank our panel.